Hey everybody, John here and welcome back to the series, How to Use Toxic Biohazard. This is going to be video number eight and we're going to be talking about the FX section. So let's go to options, reset program, and let's go to a, from a sine wave to a square wave for this demonstration. So with toxic biohazard, you have two effects modules, one on the left and one on the right, as well as this drive knob here at the top, which we'll talk to in a little bit. And then we have an EQ section that we'll get to in a little, little bit as well. So first and foremost, the way these effects start is it first starts with the left one and then it goes to the right one. If at any point you're using both of them and want to swap them, you have the option to go up to options and then go to swap effects and it will swap those effects just like it says. So to turn them on, you're going to click this button on right here next to the label of the effect. And to change the effect, we'll click this name here and we have a little list here. So we have delay, chorus, reverb, flanger, phaser, and lo-fi. So let's first talk about our delay. Let's turn this depth, blur, and rate off for now, and let's turn the delay on. So it delays the sound, and this time knob is going to determine the spacings between the delays. So this is going to be an independent time based on this knob, but if you want to have it synced up to your tempo of your song, you want to select the sync knob and then choose a certain number here. Right, so hopefully that makes sense. And the next step we have our feedback. So this is gonna be how much of those delays we're gonna have. So when this knob is here, we can see the delays. We can see them all here and see them as they fade off. If we turn this or turn this feedback a little bit down, it's much less feedback or much less delays than it was previously. If we have it up a lot, It goes on quite a while. So be careful with this knob. You don't, you don't want to go too high and just have delays going on forever. So something to keep in mind. Next up, uh, let's talk about this blur knob here. So as we listen to these delays, they're very static. It's just delay, 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 delay. This blur knob kind of acts a little bit like a reverb diffuse and kind of blends them a little bit together, which blur seems like a perfect name for it. And we can see even a little bit more harmonic content as well. That sounds almost like a dry delay. And that kind of, I guess, blurs it. And like I said, it sounds, sounds like a pretty good, uh, pretty good word. And then this mix knob here is obviously how much of that delay that you're going to hear in your mix. Like how loud that delay is. So. It's kind of think of it like your master knob for your delay. And the next up, this depth and this rate here. So this rate's dependent on the LFO. So this is going to basically detune the different versions of delays that come. So we can tell that it's changing the pitch here with this rate and this depth knob. And here's really wacky. And then the spectrum analyzer is going nuts here as well. So it's a definitely really cool feature. Um, probably not used <laughs> in most delays, but it's definitely there if you want to use it. Um, that basically covers the delay. It's, it's a pretty simplistic delay. It's very cool. Um, I kind of like different effects like that where it's, it's straightforward. You don't have a billion knobs to do very minute things. Um, it's kind of just straight to the point. And the next step we have chorus. So here's our chorus depth. And what we're hearing is basically different copies of the same sound getting detuned a little bit here. And this is again, uh, apparently attached to the LFO amount. And then the mix knob. How much of that chorus that you would like. And sometimes uh, something to keep in mind, uh, if you wanna not necessarily 
rely on unison voices, which does take more CPU. Generally, you can go with uh, the course effect, maybe even two courses if you want to do that and kind of save a little bit of CPU and still come up with a similar result. And then next up, we have the reverb, which is a pretty standard reverb, I would imagine. So this decay knob here is basically like how, think of like how big that room is. So how long it takes for the reverb to fade away. So if we have it pretty low, there's a little verb there, but it's not really that big of a room. But if we have it really cranked up, we can hear quite a bit of that, of that reverb. Next up, we have high cut. So this is basically going to take the high frequencies of the reverb and kind of dampen them a little bit, just how sound works in, in the real world. It's a subtle effect, but if you notice here when it's kind of at a lower area, the reverb's not as high endy and annoying. If it's all the way up to the top, it almost sounds fake because sound doesn't necessarily have that much high frequencies when it's reverberating. But if it's a little bit lower, that's more so how re a real reverb would sound. And then this dampening knob here, the dampening is basically the amount of time higher frequencies are reduced based on the high cut value. So these two are kind of linked in a way together. So whatever you set this at, this dampening is going to determine the time that those higher ones that are cut eventually decay. So again, it's a subtle, it's a subtle knob, these kind of both, but working with them in tandem can really make your reverb go away from the cheesy reverb sounding to a more realistic sounding. So I would not overlook these, even though that they're subtle, those are kind of important. And then next is obviously the mix knob of how much of that reverb you want in the signal. Moving on, we have a flanger, and it, flanger, if, if you're unfamiliar, it basically phase cancels using multiple copies of the same sound. So, and this delays the phase offset between the added voices. So we can tell the higher it goes up, the later those delays come in the signal or the lower value it's going to be a lot quicker and it's going to change the timbre with with a flanger as well and then the feedback is going to increase the uh the amount of the signal that's fed back into the flanger So a lot more intense. And again, with the feedback as well, like the delay, kind of be careful that you don't want to push it too high because it's going to just keep feeding back, as the knob says, and it's going to have way too much than you really intended it to have. And then this right here again is like the is the LFO-related detune speed of the voices. And the higher we go, we can tell it's getting more and more detuned. And then this depth here is going to be the uh, the amount of relative detune between the voices. Because that sounds more to me like almost an intensity of that detune rate. And then next up we have the invert mix, which is going to invert the polarity of the wet signal. And then over here on the right, it's going to invert the polarity of the feedback signal. And then here the mix in the center is, as the other ones are, how much of that effect you want to have inside your patch. Next up, we have the phaser. And phaser, they're almost related very closely to the flanger. Um, a phaser delays multiple copies of the signal, but it generally has a more intense and kind of like a, that sweeping, phasey type of sound to it. And as we see here, this frequency knob is kind of choosing the point in the frequency spectrum of where this is taking the effect. And you can tell how much more intense that is than the flanger. And again, this rate is a relative detune speed. Or the rate. And 
And then next up we have the depth, which basically controls the range of the depth, or the range of the, of the phaser. So we can see how much more it goes up and how much more it goes down, where if this was down. It's kind of just droning a little bit. And then if you want to do a big sweeping effect, and that almost sounds like a, a phaser. And we can see that exactly here within the spectrum analyzer. And this feedback is increasing the signal into the phaser. Almost sounds like a police car. And then again, the mix is how much of that phaser that you would like into the uh, into the signal. Next up, lo-fi. This one's actually really cool. One of my favorites. Uh, it can really take a sound and crush the bits to it and make it almost sound retro, analogy 80s, maybe Nintendo type of sound. And it's almost better to use this with a sine wave. So completely off, we have our sine wave. Is a really old bitty kind of sound to it and the way i would think about these knobs is this bits is going to crush the uh, the bit depth and then the samples kind of give it a different characteristic of a distortion sound and luckily since doing this you get a lot of nasty high frequency content and luckily you have a filter here that you can kind of taper that off with So you can kind of get kind of crazy with this and then have a little bit of control and some sanity while you're working on something with this filter as well. Definitely a really cool effect. And over on the right, you have all the same effects as well. So you can ma match these up as much as you want. You can have two lo-fis, two choruses, mix and match however you want to do it. And then next up here, let's reset the program. Let's get our sign. And here at the top, you have a master drive analog type of distortion so this is going to affect your entire patch as most of these effects do but this is here located at the top at the master section it's like a form of soft clipping It's kind of a cool knob. Um, I would generally kind of maybe keep it to maybe at most maybe 60-ish. It's I kind of feel it's more of a little bit to add a little bit of different texture to it. Uh, maybe a little, add some little hair on your patch and make it stand out a little bit. But definitely a cool distortion, I feel. And then last but not least, I waited till this section to talk about the EQ because although it's not technically an effect, it definitely needs to be mentioned and I felt like this was the perfect section for it. So you have this EQ at the bottom here, which is actually really convenient for, for a, a synth having it right in the front, right in front of you. So here's a little button where you turn it on and off. You've got eight bands and if you can't see this on your screen or, or this video as well, you, it starts from 62. 125, 250, 500, 1000, 2000, 4000, and 8000. And it's actually kind of nice because it's it, they say it's modeled after analog points, I would imagine, and perhaps maybe analog circuitry. But what, what I like about this, it almost gives you targeted frequencies. So if we have something like this, let's get some voices in here, another sign. So we can see it sounding a little muddy, right? So that's convenient when we have these types here. So if it's a little bit muddy, maybe pull back on the 125 and the 250 a little bit. Maybe the 62 if it's too, too muddy. Boost some highs. It's a little too much here. Let's bring this down. Or maybe we can just even use a little filter there. Take out that low end. And that's the difference that with 
no EQ. It sounds kind of muddy and gross. It's a little more focused there. You can even see the on and off here at the lower content as well. So that basically wraps up the uh, the effects and as well as the course as well. Hopefully you guys learned something. Um, I really think you should spend time with the synthesizer. You can make it sound really good. The filters are great. The effects are great. You've got six oscillators. It's got FM. You have a sequencer. So there's really not much you don't have. It would be amazing if you could draw in the envelopes. I really like that concept. But even still, that's not really that much of a hindrance, I don't think. Uh, spend some time with it, play around with it. It's one of the coolest synths the FL has, and unfortunately, like I mentioned before, it's kind of overlooked and I think kind of in the background. But uh, yeah, hopefully you guys learned something through this course. If you stuck it through this long, I know it's kind of lengthy, but um, hopefully this is all demystified now. And if you have any questions and if anything's still confusing to you, maybe please let me know and I'll uh, try my best to respond and clear that up for you. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.